Welcome, welcome to the SAG AFTRA Foundations, the business program. So wonderful to see you all here this afternoon. I'm Tamika Simpkins. I'm an actor and a SAG AFTRA Foundation staff member. Before we are joined by our guest today, I want to let you know that the SAG AFTRA Foundation is a nonprofit organization that relies in entirely on donations to provide emergency assistance and free educational programs to SAG-AFTRA artists. This conversation is made possible thanks to the generosity of our supporters. Over the past year, the Foundation has given over $7 million in COVID relief to more than 7,500 performers. If you are SAG-AFTRA artists and need help, please ask. And if you can help, please give. Information can be found in the description of this video, and we thank you for your support. Now, without further ado, it is my honor and pleasure to introduce our panelists of commercial agents today. Mike Abrams, Juliana Castro, Stuart K. Robertson, and Alicia Ruskin. Thank you all so much for being here today. We would love for each one of you to introduce yourself and share a fun fact about yourself to share with the with the audience today. Alicia, would you like to start? I, I will start. Um, Excellent. I'm Alicia, I'm Alicia Ruskin. I'm a partner here at Kazarian Measures Ruskin and Associates. And um, a uh, fun fact is I went to university with two of the three creators of the Friends series. They wrote a musical at school that I was in. We got to go to the Kennedy Center and on a six week USO tour of Germany and Italy. And when I run into them from time to time, they are lovely people. Awesome. That's fun. Thanks so much, Alicia. Mike? Hi, my name is Mike Abrams and uh, I'm one of the partners at AKA Talent Agency. And my fun fact is in 1986, I had a letter uh, printed in Sports Illustrated that I wrote as an angry 13-year-old uh, lambasting the Los Angeles Lakers because I was the world's biggest Boston Celtics fan. Oh, that's an amazing fun fact. Thanks so much for sharing that, Mike. That's hilarious. <laughs> uh, Juliana. Um, hi, I'm Juliana Castro from CESD Talent. And my fun fact is... I am currently training for a Tough Mudder, so thank you for your prayers. <laughs> <laughs> also, thanks so much for sharing, Juliana. And lastly, but not leastly, Mr. Stuart K. I'm Stuart K. Robinson. I'm the CEO and co-owner of Brady Brennan and Rich Talent. Um, I've done just about every job in the entertainment industry you can do. I was a casting director for 13 years. I was an actor for a long time. Um, I also had uh, one of the largest commercial uh, audition classes in town. Uh, I was going to change my fun fact to say that I'm no longer speaking to Mike Abrams. <laughs> shows the Celtics over the Lakers. Um, but I'll switch to um, when I was in college, I was an All-American cheerleader. Love it. Love it. Fellow cheerleaders in the house. Thanks so much for sharing, Stuart. What a wonderful panel today. And we are so happy to have you here with us today to share information with our participants. Before we get started with the pre-questions that we already have, please feel free to put your questions in the chat. And we have our amazing moderators here to feed us those questions if they have not already been asked. So let's get started for our panel today. When is an ideal time of the year that commercial reps are interviewing actors? And anybody can jump in whenever you want. Well, I'll start. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, I already apologize to the panel that my opinions may be different than theirs. Uh, I'm going to say there is no bad time if you are a moneymaker. Um, <laughs> people try to put this uh, business into seasons and there used to be seasons years back, but there aren't seasons anymore. There's not even a fall television season. There's not really a pilot season for, for, for most of us um, with the exception of Christmas day and new year's day. Uh, if you can articulate the fact that you are a moneymaker, uh, there is always a good time. If you cannot articulate the fact that you're a moneymaker, uh, there's never a good time. So there's no time of year. Today is the day if you've got your ammunition in place. Excellent. Excellent. Anyone else? 
Um, I would agree. I think that he's, he's absolutely right. There are no more seasons. It's kind of what's going on in our world and we're always looking. It's just whether or not you're, it's the luck of timing. Uh, sometimes we just picked up four people in your category or we're not necessarily going to take on someone else and you never know what's going on in each individual agency. Okay, great. Uh, let's keep going. Uh, what does your ideal agent client relationship look like? Uh, I'll, I'll jump in on that. Um, fortunately, we, we, we have many ideal relationships to, uh, to, to draw from. Um, I, I think the, the point is it is a relationship. We talk about, you know, you work for me, we work for you. It is a team effort. I like to say that um, my actor and I are both working for that actor's career. There's this almost third thing that comes into play between the two of us that we're working for together. It takes some of the kind of personal issues out of it. Um, sometimes I'll have to say something pretty harsh. Um, and that's because I am trying to get the actor's career to the place it needs to be. And, and the actor may need some help in that area. And here's some hard truths. So communication is vital. Um, respect, uh, being not only you know, on time and, and ready to go at the audition, but responsive um, to our requests whether it's for material or a meeting or, or whatever. And the same would go from us, from us to you. It's just really about keeping the doors of communication open and knowing that as agents, maybe this is how the agent manager relationship differs. We're not on the phone to you every day, probably or just our roster is, is too lengthy for that kind of communication, but we are looking at your photo almost every day. We're thinking about you frequently and then we may not, speak or or you may not hear from us for a little bit but trust us behind the scenes there's a lot going on and then that that beautiful audition comes through and of course the joy of calling with a booking i would i would add to that uh, i concur with with what uh with what alicia said i would say trust honesty and and empathy i think you know uh, being able to know that our clients are doing the best that they can and you know putting everything into into their auditions and into their jobs and also that they trust us you know th th that's one of the most gratifying things for me is uh you know uh, you know we help actors do their jobs and they and, and they help us do ours and anytime an actor uh, uh can can show that they understand that we're doing our jobs and that we work hard and you know that we're really doing everything for them that's greatly appreciated in the same way obviously that you know that, that we appreciate the work that they're doing so it's really a back and forth it's a two-way street excellent excellent and a big part is communication as well i think that's something that the actors sometimes forget is that we're staring at your picture every day but we're not on the phone with you ever, all the time and a lot of the times we don't know what your hair looks we don't know what's going on in your life so like if there are changes if you just i get it pandemic everyone grew out their hair or lost weight <laughs> gained weight like did whatever they had to do which was fine and that's never an issue but like if you're in Texas and you we represent you in Los Angeles and we didn't know, like, how, how are we supposed to know that? We were joking before, we're, we're not following all of our clients on social media, you know, not the way the same, half the time my boss doesn't even know where in the world I am. Like, as a joke, like, I was home in, in Connecticut for, for months at a time because my parents have more land. So I got to go and hang out and see my family because I live across the country. And my boss knew where I was, but like the rest of the company had no idea because we weren't communicating. Other departments were just like, what time zone are you in? I'm like, I'm working West Coast time on East Coast, which wasn't an issue. But unless we know where in the world you are, what you look like, you know, if you're going on vacation, all those types of things that I think have since fallen off because of the pandemic, everyone assumes that everything's a little more lackluster. It's not anymore. Things are back to being buttoned up. Like, Back to being professional, just because we're working from home doesn't mean we're not working. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much. So we have a follow up question as we're talking about, you know, actors careers and being supportive of their careers. And then also with Stuart Stewart's uh, comment about, you know, presenting yourself as a moneymaker. Someone had a follow up question. Well, what does being a moneymaker mean exactly? 
Okay, I'll start on this since I opened that door. Um, there's a term that I use that is called evidence of your greatness. Uh, most of you refer to that as a reel, but uh, my philosophy is a reel is a sort of stringing together of things you've been able to book so far. That's evidence of what you've done. In order for you to uh, catch the attention of a new agent, you're uh, needing to have evidence of your potential greatness. So, um, so for us, a moneymaker is a combination of things. It's someone we sense already is immensely talented. It's someone who has the personality and the savvy to be able to work the room. It's someone who has some experience in the business. And it's someone who uh, understands their responsibilities as a business person. So those are the things you're trying to communicate uh, at all times. And I saw someone ask a question, how do you do that without being a braggart? Well, how does the person at the car dealership uh, get you to buy the Civic over the Accord? Um, are they bragging about the Civic or are they talking about a product that's really good and the, the, the selling points of that product? So you got to think of yourself like a company. Uh, brag? Brag would be... Um, trying to get our attention, talking about how great your product is and how useful it is and in what areas it can be sold and bought. That's not bragging. That's business. That's my start. Excellent. I also think it's our job to recognize a moneymaker. I think that's part of being an agent. You just have that sense when you're in the presence of somebody that this person has something. It's it's charisma. It's, it's some quirk uh, in the commercial business specifically, which we're all here to talk about. It's knowing what's trending in terms of a look or a kind of energy. And it goes through cycles where reality television brought in the advent of real people, which a lot of the people who you would say walk in a room and they're all chiseled and tall and perfect and look like actors, those people couldn't get arrested for a long time because it kind of went the other way. So, so the moneymaker may not even recognize that in themselves sometimes. I mean, we've all picked up people, developmental people, and they just want to work. And we're just like, you've got it. This is what you have to do. Trust me. And then they go on and they, they make you money. And I think the way that you present yourself in the submission is, uh, you know, like like Stuart was talking about, is one of one of the ways you can show evidence of of your being a money maker. That you know, if you can present yourself well to an agent, it's likely that you can present yourself well to a casting director and to a client. And that means good headshots. You know, that means professional resume. That means you know, so many of the submissions are emails. That means a you know a, a well written brief business like email. Um, if you have relationships with casting directors, I mean, obviously what we all like off, off the top of the bat is uh, low hanging fruit. If you're already booking, if you have commercials running, if you have relationships with casting directors you're seeing on a regular basis, obviously those things are great. Otherwise, you know, uh, it's, it's important to watch TV. It's important to watch commercials and to know what kinds of people are being hired so that you can have an idea of what the market is looking for. And I, I like submissions like that, where they say, well, here are some commercials that I've seen that I'd be you, that, that I'd be great in. Here's some roles that I could have booked. This is the type that I am. Excellent. Thank you so much. Let's continue on this, this train of being money makers and talking about the business part and the marketing part. Uh, what is a top character trait that you see in your own successful clients? Someone who's not complacent. I think the worst thing, and I think I would hope that the other ones, that the other agents agree with me, we're never annoyed when someone's like, look at what I'm doing or inviting us to, you know, a UCB or a grounding show or something like that, you know, saying like, this is what I'm doing. I would love if you could come. I understand if you can't, or, you know, I just did, you know, this co-star, this guest star, I saw my commercial. I am currently taking classes or, you know, I'd love to take some headshots or even just asking like, do you need headshots? Um, do, do we think that we need anything? And not in like a badgering way, but someone who's proactive, you know, it's, there's nothing wrong with making relationships in Los Angeles. So I ha we have clients that I didn't even realize they all knew each other, but you know, they were in an acting class together or they met through an improv class or they did a short film or something and they're out and about and they're always, you know, they're always trying, which is the most important thing because 
if you sit back and relax in this town, you're not going to be successful because there's way too many people behind you that are going to outrun you if they can. We always say, I can't want your career more than you want your career. I think it's also important to have a good, full, rich life as a human being when you're, when you're an actor. Uh, I, I like to think that if it's kind of a dry spell between jobs that that you are not just devastated, that, that you have a community of friends and fellow actors that you can commiserate with. And when you walk into my office, you are upbeat and, and you know, saying thank you for what you're doing. You're appreciative. You're, I hate the word needy because it sounds so needy, but that sense of I'm taking care of myself. I know you're doing your job. I'm doing my job and everything's going to be all right. It's, it's, that's the courage of the actor, I think, is to have, have a sense of faith that the next thing is coming for me. I'm going to show up, suit up every day and get out there and, and I'm going to be, I'm going to be fine. And there's something when you audition with that sense of how can I serve you, the casting director, how can I serve and, and fill your problem that you have? You've got to cast this, let it be me. Uh, I just think people respond to that and they relax and they take a breath and go, this guy is or woman is going to just take care of everything for me. And I feel it's going to go well. Excellent. Thanks so much for those. Those are great. So which segues into our next question, of course, as we talk about, you know, the successful traits in the talent and the client that you have. And we know that all reps have different ways they like to communicate with their roster. Uh, What is the best or ideal ways that you like to communicate with your clients to keep these careers moving forward? Well, I'll start. At BBR, we have a pretty much open door policy. Our clients are welcome to come in and talk to us at any time. Obviously, we want them to pick and choose and not come and hang out for three hours every day. But we tend to get more upset when our clients don't visit us for the reasons that Juliana was talking about. We like to see your new haircut and we like to see what what you're feeling and what you're doing, et cetera. We, we sort of see it as friendships because I remind my staff almost every week that, you know, in our job, we have allowed someone to place their dreams in our hands. And in order for me to really understand that dream and really promote that dream, I need to understand the artist. So how do we like to communicate? Always. We like them to drop in. We like them to email us. We like them to call us when they need to. Um, Social media, we follow our clients' social media, so we see what's going on. We want to know as much about our clients as we can within reason. As Alicia said, we have a lot of clients, so we can't pay the kind of individual attention that maybe every client would like. But those who uh, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So if you are staying in touch with us, we'll stay in touch with you. Uh, back when we, that's right. Back when we were actually in an office, we you know we, we didn't we didn't mind the in person visits either. Uh, you know as you know during during the pandemic, uh, you know I never mind emails, especially when they're updates about like here's what's going on with me. You know uh, here's what I'm appearing in. Here's what I look like now. Here's what's going on in my life. Uh, e- emails are easy to deal with or easy to deal with, you know, at, at a time uh, and, and place of my choosing. If somebody just wants to just wants to send an update, I can, you know, I can have it in my inbox until until there's an appropriate time to to respond. I started texting a lot more during the pandemic, you know, and so I, you know, it, that doesn't bother me at all. I mean, like Stuart said, you know, we like to communicate every way available. Ideally, it happens organically. I mean, ideally. We're communicating on a, on a regular or semi-regular basis because we have business con- to conduct. There are auditions, there are callbacks, there are you know bookings and renegotiations, and you know that's that's the ideal way it happens. But uh, uh, all all of the above work as well. Juliana, did you have a, a comment? Uh, yeah, I don't. I, see, I'm still of the the email because the thing about texting is I'm on my phone, but I'm not on my phone. So I can't, I can't unread a text message. So everyone's like, why didn't you answer that? And I was like, because I was in the middle of something, but like instinctually I read all, like I I'll read all the texts because I hate notifications. So I'll just read it. And then I'll be like, I'm going to answer that. And then two days go by and I haven't answered it. So I like the fact that I can like flag emails. Um, and 
yeah, our, we are still, our office is still not open to visitors yet. We used to have an open door policy, but we're still not in the office full time. Um, my boss and I are only in there one day a week and it's still close to the public. So I want it to, to be open again eventually. So we do miss having our clients and having them say hello. Although I think once we reopen, we're probably going to have to have, how's it working for you guys? Like, do you guys have like a schedule, like when the office is actually open? Cause I'm worried that like, I'm going to have like 50 people in one day and I'm like, I can't, I have work to do. <laughs> I'm a little worried. <laughs> That's a good point. We haven't planned everything, but you're probably right. Once the office is officially open to the public, we'll probably have to divide up the days of the week by by letters of the alphabet to keep everybody from showing up on one day. Thanks for pointing that out. Something else to put on our list. Looking forward to meeting some people for the first time. If we you know, we sign people during the pandemic and only met them like this, it's like you know, I we we've hired people to you know staff members that that we only met for the first time. Do you think it's important when you sign a new client or, um, you know, to continue this relationship that there is an, a discussion about how to communicate with you all? I hear from so many actors, because I teach some of the business of the business classes here at the foundation, that they're so afraid to communicate with their agents. And I'm like, but why? It's supposed to be a business relationship. How are you supposed to have a business relationship if you don't communicate? And so do you think that's important to set, here's how I want to communicate with you all moving forward? I think Most actors ask yeah. that in the meeting. Do you find that yeah. how do you want to be communicated? They mean something that they kind of ask. So, yes. Mm -hmm. Especially when you're brand new too. I think like a, like a follow-up a week or two after you sign or whatever, just being like, hey guys, it was really nice to meet you kind of remind us of what we talked about because especially when you're not in person and you know meetings are shorter just because you don't it's there's more awkward silences when you're not in the room together or at least it feels more awkward so just like remind us of like who you are and you know let, let us know what's going on because if not then you get mishmashed in our brain because it's all screens now you know Remind us what you look like. Remind us, you know, what you do. Remind us of your skills. If you have an updated reel, any of that kind of thing is good just for us to get to know you better. Because normally for us, you know, you'd come in, we'd ask you to get pictures. So within the first six months, you're coming in to meet us, to sign contracts, hopefully with, to discuss pictures. And we're seeing you in person multiple times. And this way, it's all digital. So it's a little harder to develop that relationship. But never, if you're feeling awkward to email your reps, then you might not be with the right at reps. Yeah, it's so hard for me to picture somebody being nervous. If I've met someone, if we've had, if we've had a meeting, it's very difficult for me to wrap my head around the idea that they'd be nervous about reaching out to me. You know, I, I hope that's not the, that's not the vibe I give off, especially if we've had a meeting, it obviously went positively. We, you know, we, we, we signed you. It would uh, uh, concern me. If somebody came away from that and said, Oh, I'm, you know, I, you know, I, I don't want to bug him. Uh, you know, like we were talking about with, with emails and texts, like I'm, I'm perfectly capable of, 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 of leaving those until an appropriate time. So, you know, I guess that's what I, I would encourage everyone. I mean, first of all, like Juliana said, if, if, if you don't feel comfortable, if you're with an agent, you don't feel comfortable contacting, that's something to look at. You know, I, I, that's the, that, that's something to think about. I agree. Thank you so much for sharing that because I've, I've heard the question enough to say the same thing that you're saying. So thank you so much for confirming that. Uh, now that we're talking about digital and we're talking about quarantine and the virtual world, which segues into our next question, what percentage of auditions are virtual right now and where do you see it going? Are talent agents still welcoming hard copy submissions or is email the way to go to reach out to uh, representatives? I, Stuart, I see your face. Just go. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, yeah, it's pretty much all uh, email now. I'm answering backwards. Um, we don't we don't deal with a lot of hard copy uh, photos anymore. Uh, email is just much easier, and usually most companies have a, a a specific website, a specific email address you can do submissions to. It'll be submissions at CESD or whatever it is. Um, in terms of your first question, ah, I answered the second one last, so I forgot the first one. Uh, what percentage do you see well, auditions being virtual right now? Yeah, I'd say right now it's about 90% virtual. And where do I see it going? I don't think it's ever going back to fully live. 
Um, I can't predict the percentage, but I would think that the larger percentage is going to be self tapes from here forward. I think they found a way that uh, works and cuts down on a lot of um, uh, travel and waiting and scheduling. I think the casting directors who own facilities will cling viciously to in-person auditions and try to justify the cost of their facility or get rid of their facility. But I think for the most part, you're going to see a majority of self tapes and virtual auditions. I think callbacks might, um, might be a larger percentage of live, but I think first calls are going to be continue to be largely virtual. I, I agree. I think it's, it's going to, to be hybrid. Um, you know, I was thinking more, maybe 80% are going to, are virtual. I think more and more people are, and some offices go back and forth. They yeah. have some in person and the next day they, you know, they, they don't. And it's, you're, you're trying to get your head around, you know, who's what, when you're doing your, your submission, because our clients sometimes, you know, are in Florida or are in Texas and that's fine. Uh, they're going to fly back for a job, but we have to, it's like, if they're going to have callbacks in person, I know that person can't get back for the callback because they're in Texas. Should I not submit? You know, there's a lot more we have to think about uh, as opposed to just choosing the best person for the job um, in this case. But one thing I did, I did want to say is in, in terms of, um, uh, you know, uh, taking on a new client, we, uh, we used to, you know, look at a reel, look at their professional work, and that really helped us. I, I would now add, I want to see someone do a self-tape audition for me before I will take them on. I have to know that they have the background and the framing and the lighting, and they have to be able to audition effectively at home um, and have that, you know, minimal skill and minimal, you know, requirements to do that, or else uh, it's just going to, they're just going to burn too many auditions with bad auditions in that way. So that's one thing that I never, never thought about because commercials were never virtual, never self tapes before the pandemic. So that's one thing everybody should be proficient at before they start looking for an agent. Awesome, thank you so much. So speaking of looking for an agent and sex ways into our next question again, uh, it seems most SAG after commercials are only available through agents when we don't have representation yet. What is your advice to find a SAG after commercial uh, audition to build a body of work so that we can get representation? So the question is how to book a SAG commercial without an agent? Pretty much, yes. Mm. Mm. I don't think I have an answer. I'd like, mm. I like. I don't have an answer for that. Yeah, the, 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 go, I'm sorry, Juliana. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, I just don't. I just don't know. I've never, I've only ever been on this side. I was never an actor. I like. I can't even imagine going through the process. L let's answer it this way. If you have the chops to book a, a, a SAG after a commercial, that means you have the chops to land an agent. So uh, my advice would be focus on um, accumulating the materials that are going to make an agent see that you're a bookable person. Um, there aren't a lot of casting directors who are interested in taking submissions from unrepresented artists because there are so many artists represented by agents. So let's flip the question and say, yeah, there's a way to book commercials without an agent, but why? If you've got the stuff, you've got the talent, all you need now is the evidence and agents are looking for you. We're looking for people who can book a SAG after a commercial. So put your focus there, get yourself an agent and let's get this train rolling. I think, yes, yeah, exactly. And, and the other, I think the first part of that question, it sounds like I have to have a commercial to show you the commercial agent. You don't need that. Uh, very rarely, Will, will someone have like a full commercial reel? Most people already have agents. <laughs> so, so they just have to have some material depending on, you know, you could have, you could be from um, a smaller market and there just isn't that much commercial work going on. So you've got your indie films and you've, you know, you've got your monologue or whatever it is, and that's what you're showing. And then I can extrapolate this person could be fine in a commercial. Awesome. Awesome. So speaking of smaller markets, we're going to transition into maybe someone transitioning from a smaller agency and maybe wanting to tear up. Do you have any advice on transitioning from a smaller agency to maybe an agency of your caliber? 
You mean from out of town or from within town? Uh, both. We could do out uh, of town too. I mean, typically, typically those come from casting director or manager referrals. If somebody is already with an agent and is working uh, and, you know, for, for whatever reason, they want to be with a bigger agency, there's, you know, there's something going on that, that they want to change. Often those come through the, you know, the, the casting director referrals that, you know, hey, this person's been booking a bunch with us, but I know they don't get to see the rest of the town or whatever it is. Would you like to meet them? If someone's coming from out of town, I love it when agents from other cities reach out out to recommend a client. I think that's great. I love having relationships with agents in other cities because we have people move away that, that need help sometimes. Uh, and also I'd like to be the person that, that they refer people to. So uh, for someone in a smaller market moving to Los Angeles, I would, you know, I, I, assuming things are going well with your agent, I'd ask them to make some cold calls. And if they don't already have relationships, I'd ask them to, you know, to, to, to reach out. Uh, relationships with agents in Los Angeles can benefit small market uh, agencies as well. So uh, that's the way that I go about that. I would go about it. Awesome. Also be patient as well, because when you're coming from such a smaller market, people don't realize that there are just such some, there aren't as many casting directors there. Maybe there is a similar, you know, not as many jobs, but everyone in town will know you. I think um, Michael Sanford loves posting on, so, on, on like social or Facebook whenever he gets really annoyed with people not showing up to auditions and he'll put out stats. He'll put out the numbers and we'll screenshot them and just like send them amongst ourselves within the company because people don't believe us. But he gets jobs where he gets 4,000 submissions per role, sends out 150 auditions and like 50 callbacks. And there's one day where like 17 people didn't show up for their national network audition. He was like, well, moving on. And it is what it is. And there's so many people in this town that, you know, when we give you recommendations, you know, change a headshot, take a commercial class, take a, take a commercial cast with a casting director. I mean, some of the, Stuart had his own, but so many casting directors in this town have huge ones that are run by their camera operators that, you know, it's getting your name out there. And we're not saying these things for you to waste money. We're saying these things to help benefit you. One thing that uh, the advent of digital casting, which is now 20 years old, um, not online, but, you know, ha- all the pictures and we're not messengering hard copy pictures. We're doing everything online. Is that it really leveled the playing field for agencies, in my opinion, in this town? So, you know, when you had hard copy pictures, they didn't have time to open every agent's package. They have plenty of time to open 4,000 thumbnail photos. So if you're with a small agent and they are passionate about you and they're getting out, it's not always greener across the street to be honest, to be then, you know, you are their top person at this boutique agency and you will go in and you will be one of 20 people who you're seeing in the rooms anyway. Um, You know, it's, you really want to think about that. I'm not saying don't take some meetings, but, you know, maybe dance with the person who brought you for a while. Um, And, you know, there are people that I've met with and I would love to have, and they're like, nope, she's been loyal to me. I'll be loyal to her. Awesome. Thank you so much. Those are great answers. I've always learned uh, as we segue into our next topic, um, when you don't have specific credits, uh, reps and casting directors tend to look at your training and your background and your skills. Is there any training or skills that you look at um, when you're interviewing potential clients? Improv. You know, I, I, improv is such an important skill for booking commercials, um, really, regard, re, regardless of the type. Uh, so you know, especially, you know, I, I don't know whether, whether this is a fault or not, but so, you know, like the brand improv places, the Growlings, UCB, Second City, uh, you know, uh, that kind of training, it means something, especially if you've gone through the ranks at any of those places. That, that definitely helps. And I think they're name brands because they have a, long history of success which is why we go why we keep going back there you know yeah. i mean the amount of people i haven't we used to have have gone through sunday company and main company mm-hmm. they're successful and i've in the years that i've been at cesd i've seen people go from hardly getting auditions to being on snl you know here's where i go off the rails a little bit i'm sorry <laughs> i saw you smiling Stuart. i was like i'm looking forward to that answer <laughs> Because, listen, I, I, 
I just cannot believe that there is anyone on this entire thing who has ever gotten signed because of what's on their resume. The reason for that is if your photo and your evidence of greatness, your reel, doesn't catch my attention, there's no way I'm going to look at your resume and go, oh, well, trained here, let's give this person a shot. There's nothing on your resume that is going to impress any of us. Because if there was something on your resume that would impress us, we would know you. That's our job. We're in the business to know the talent in the nation. So I'm trying to imagine, because I'm sure we take all the resumes that are on this Zoom, 300 and 400 people, et cetera, put all the credits together. I promise you there's going to be 2% of titles that we've heard of. Because that's how I started with a student film here and an independent thing there and a little thing there, et cetera. None of that is going to impress an agent. It's going to tell me that you've been in front of the camera. There's points for that. You're training that you've learned some things, et cetera. But it's not enough to move the needle to make me go, oh, my God, we should sign this person. So forgive my differing opinion from most common advice. But I say, again say, put your efforts into evidence of greatness. If I see 20 seconds of killer footage and you really carrying the day, I don't care what's on the resume because I see what you can do. Vice versa will never happen. What will I see on your resume that I go, oh, my God, get out the pen. Let's sign this person. Put your energy into evidence of greatness. And then Stuart will tell you to go take an improv class because the casting directors want to see that on the resume, right? Yeah, well, you know, when earlier when you were asking what are some of the things you need, you, in commercials, you need to be pretty improvisational and not in the Saturday Night Live comedy way, but in the, you know how to take a moment and bring it to life. So that kind of training is very helpful. But again, I can't imagine any of us not being interested in the photo, not being interested in the reel, and then going and saying, oh, well, groundlings, well, bring them in. Ain't going to happen. Okay. What if, you, oh. what if you don't have a reel, someone asks? Get one. Get one. <laughs> That'd be like a, a department store that doesn't have a picture window. How are you going to get customers inside if you don't have something in the window for people to go, ooh, that looks good. Get one. Done speaking. <laughs> nope. Love it. Keep the, keep the information coming because that's what we're here for. Uh, so let's continue on the evidence of greatness and talking about training and our marketing. What are some things that stand out for you, you all in cover letters, promotional materials, self-tapes, evidence of greatness? What catches your attention? Well, I think Mike had said earlier, short to the, to the point, the, the, uh, we, we know that you've always dreamt of being a performer. Uh, we, we, we know the whole backstory um, because everybody is, has that in their history. Um, I think the best cover letter starts off with saying, I've just come off my 20th national commercial <laughs> <laughs> and I bought a boat with my income. Um, barring that, um, you just, you just want to put the highlights out. If you know anybody in the industry, if you're referred by anybody, you want to put that out. I think somebody mentioned if there are some commercials that you have seen, you're like, I really feel like I'm the flow from progressive or, or the emu guy from Liberty mutual, or I'm getting that wrong. Um, you know, keep it short and fun. If you're, if you're funny, be funny. If you're not just be straightforward. Uh, you don't need to put 50 different pictures, but a couple of different photos. Um, that's why email is nice because you can get all of that on one place. But do not make us go to some virus laden website anywhere. The, the other thing about links, some, some agents will not open a link. So you want to be really careful when you send material um, that it's in a kind of a safe, secure spot. So you're not turning anybody off because we're all so scared of viruses these days. You know, with regard to the cover letter, it's a business letter. You know, it's, it's, it's a business communication. You're communicating information to someone in the hopes that you're going to have a business relationship. Uh, at least you said, if you're funny, be funny. Uh, you know, maybe, re you know, uh, to some extent that's true. But I, I would say in general for me, resist the urge to show how clever you are in, in, in your cover letter. 
if the first couple lines are, you know, are, 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 you know, like a riddle or a, that, that are clearly supposed to be some sort of hook, I'm, I'm personally just not into it. It's, you know, I, I, you know, like, like we've all said, clear to the point, you know, I, uh, we'll keep on doing the evidence of greatness, Stuart. I'm going to, I'm going to probably be repeating this for a week. Copyright. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you a buck. Um, you, you, know, you know, you know, put your case forward, and you know, you know, present your 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 information. Again, maybe it's just me. I, you know, I'm I'm not interested in 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 reading a short story. I, I'm looking for a business cover letter. Yeah, also, let me. I don't to, need okay. to be a, no, but has, like it really annoys me when I says I'm this and this person's love child. Mm, like yeah. like you need to be secure in yourself saying like i am my own person and this is why i don't need to know that like ryan reynolds and will ferrell had it like a love child and that's you i think that's just <laughs> odd also getting oddly personal i've had people like before i went private on all my socials was stalking my instagram was like i saw that you were in palm springs i love this restaurant and that like oh, nope we are business people as much as it's a relationship there is a line um that makes it uncomfortable you know being respectful is a big thing and once you develop those relationships like those are the types of things we can talk about but like uh, right off the bat there is a line where that be aware of be conscious of and you know i know that the lines are getting blurred now especially everyone's working from home and cell phones and texting all this stuff but I don't know. That's just my, just my two cents. So let me try to make it easy. Cause first of all, I want to say this, there is no one way you're going to hear all kinds of different opinions from us. And one of us likes this and one of us doesn't like that, et cetera. But here's the easy way. Put yourself in our shoes. How would you want to be approached if you were a buyer? Cause I'm going to cut to the chase and tell you when I'm reading your cover letter, if the first couple sentences don't rope us in, we're not reading the rest of that. So again, as Mike said, cut to the chase. Right. When you thumb through the channels on your TV, there's a little description of each episode. Look at how that sentence is written. It either makes you go, ooh, I want to check that out, or it makes you not. When you're looking at your films on Netflix or whatever it is, it either makes you go, oh, that's an interesting story, or it doesn't. Do that. It can't be any longer than those things because nobody's reading. If the first sentence doesn't make me go, huh, I'm not going to read an entire cover letter about how you grew up in Michigan <laughs> and you traveled to here and you did all that. Don't and don't start your thing with I'm an actor, trained actor in Los Angeles seeking representation. Why else would you be sending me this email? Don't tell me what I already know. Tell me what I don't already know. Give me the headline, the thing that makes you watch that TV show. Give me the thing that makes you watch us. And as Juliana is saying, don't approach us in a way you wouldn't want to be approached. If you want to avoid being creepy, don't be creepy. You don't want to be stalky, don't be stalky. You want to not be corny, don't be corny. But do what you do, cut to the chase, and make us call you back. You, you well, can't force a relationship. You can't assume a relationship before one is invited. I love it. You all are bringing the knowledge up in here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So let's get to one final question. As we did talk about social media a little bit, as Juliana pinpointed, are there any tips for maintaining your social media presence as an actor or a talent? Realizing oh, that social media oh. is a job. If you want your social media to be taken seriously, don't think of it as something fun you do on the side. Think of it as a branch of your career. The same way you train commercials different than theatrical, than you do print, than you do voiceover. Social media is its own beast. You are now a brand. You need to understand that and appreciate it. And if you're not ready to put in the work and you know do the research and make sure that, I mean, it's a sunshine silver lining of your life is what social media is but it takes a lot of work and people joke like why are people taking 1700 selfies for one because they know what they're doing i'm not that person i take like three or four photos but they're it's not my job i'm not in front of the camera so understanding that and also just being careful about what you're doing because the internet is forever 
That's what I was going to say is I think for the, you know, for the average actor, in my belief is that social media can absolutely do more harm than good. I, I think, you know, if you're an influencer and you, or if your intention is to be an influencer and you want to grow your numbers and make money that way, then, you know, then that's one thing, and you know, and, and grow your brand. But in general, in, in every single callback session, in every single meeting that they're having, deciding who they're going to hire, they are going to look for your socials. And, you know, it's, it's just a fact of life, whether it's fair or not. I know actors that have business accounts and personal accounts. And if you want to have a personal account that's, that's hidden and shared only among your friends, great. But, you know, understand that anything that you put on social media can absolutely and can and does have an impact on on your on your higher ability. And so, you know, anytime if I were an actor and you know, I don't have social media at all, we were talking about this before, I, you know, I, you know, consider how anything you post could potentially have an impact on 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 your career. I think most of the time, you know, uh, like I said, I, I think it does a lot more harm than good. Mike, my carrier pigeon is outside your window and can't get in. Oh, man, since I, it's the freest <laughs> thing, I, you know, I love it. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, Mike said a great thing about a, a, a business account. We love knowing what you had for breakfast, but it doesn't um, really mix with what we're talking about here. So I think what everybody is saying is uh, I have seen instances where the clients on a given commercial want to sort of look at your social media and make sure you don't have any outrageous stuff or political views that are et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I'm not telling you not to have whatever political views you want to have, whatever social life you want to have, et cetera. I just want you to understand, as Juliana says, that you can't take it away. So that becomes a part of your job. If you go to my uh, uh, Instagram, it's all the same stuff. It's all just within my brand. I don't go outside my brand. It's all me encouraging artists to be the best they can be. It's all me talking about this industry that I love. I don't mix in other stuff because that's why it's there. I don't need you to know what I had for breakfast because I don't eat breakfast. I also want to say that when Juliana said it's a job, uh, it's, it takes a lot of work for a professionally front-facing social media account. And you don't have to do that. You don't have to do any of it as an actor. I think people get really, do I have to have social media? I'm like, I'm not going to get this job if I don't have any presence on social. That's just not true. There's a, there's a small subset of, of, of work, not the commercial work, but certain projects that they cast people based on their following because those people are going to market the movie for them. But that is right now, pretty niche and it's not true across the board. So don't spend time worrying about your evidence of greatness. And, uh, and we're going to make Juliana say it next. Um, we're all going to work for Steve. <laughs> and, and don't, don't really worry about the fact that your social media is not, you know, current or you just post occasionally, as long as it's nothing that anybody else has talked about here, that's going to get you not hired because it's offensive in some way. I think especially right now in the world, there's a big, there's a lot of evidence of things that were done a couple of years ago that are now coming back to bite people. And it's because of the fact that once you're successful, people are going to want what you have and are going to go back down the rabbit hole and find it. And which is why some people are getting quote unquote canceled, which is a whole other world. But you have to understand the same thing with like standups. We had a, we had a person a couple of years ago who was working for a brand and was a stand-up comic and a couple of years before becoming the face of that brand had said some not nice things and someone had gone down the rabbit hole of YouTube and found it. And it, you know, it was what it was and it's a terrible situation and, you know, not our fault because we didn't know, but you have to be aware that the more success you get, the more people are going to want to tear you down because they want what you have already worked for. So when you're putting everything you think of onto social media or onto anything that people can record, you're making choices that you don't know the long-term implications. Excellent. Thank you so much. I thought Juliana was going to say evidence of greatness real close. She came real close to it. So final, final thing. You all have been so amazing sharing this wonderful information with our audience. Uh, is there any 
anything, any golden nuggets you wish to share uh, with the the members uh, that you wish, oh, I wish every actor just knew this and it everything would be so much better. Do you have any golden nuggets you'd like to share with us before we depart? Well, I'll, I'll jump in to, to say that probably everybody watching knows this, but I have gotten cover letters that said like, well, I, you know, I just want to do a few commercials before I make it big in film and TV. Like it's something that you just want to check off the bucket list. It is so difficult to book a commercial. It is super competitive. The people out there are mad talented that are doing this. So just respect the commercial advertising world as an actor. It's going to take as much focus. It's harder because very often there's a script. There's no real character. You're just walking in. What do I do in a commercial? You know, that's what classes are for. Um, it, it really asks you to be open and vulnerable and porous in, in auditions and take what's coming at you. And uh, it's, it's, it's a really, really challenging. It's why I keep doing it. I'm fascinated by the whole process. So just respect, respect the art that is commercial acting. Excellent. I would add to that, enjoy it. And if you're not enjoying it, please stop doing it. You know, I, 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 this is a tough business. It, it is it is very difficult for everyone. And uh, uh, you see a lot of people sort of get trapped in, uh, you know, uh, tra trapped in golden handcuffs. And and it's a shame to see. And I think to, to, to be able to succeed at this, you have to like it. You have to like the hustle. You have to like things like this panel and meetings with agents and auditioning, you know, like that whole process. If you find that process to be, you know, you know, to be terrible, you know, you know, find something else to do because that is the, you know, that is the deal. The work and the money are the rewards for a job well done. Your job is the hustle. Your job is the auditions and the headshots and the training and the meetings and the networking and all that stuff so that you can get the reward for a job well done, which is getting paid for what you do. So if you don't love it, if you don't like, or at least like, you don't have to love it every moment because it is really hard. But if you're not really, you know, passionate about it, it's going to be a tough, tough road. And, you know, and, and it makes it harder for the rest of us. Juliana said at the beginning of this, one of my you know, favorite lines, you know, that, that your agent can't care more about this than you do. You know, I, I, you know, I, I just I was literally going to reiterate that. <laughs> In financial terms. Yeah. Well, you took my line first. In financial terms, agents make 10%. So, you know, uh, we care, I think, more than, you know, more than 10 percent uh, uh, about the jobs. But again, we can't care more about it than the actor does. And again, I understand it's really hard. I'm not an actor. I'm an agent. I, I don't think I would be able to take it. I think it would be too difficult for me. But, uh, uh, you know, that that is the road. Juliana, uh, Mike stole your, your comment, but you're welcome to, to repeat it and iterate it again because it's still good information if you like. No, it really is just, you know, about like trust and communication for us. That's our biggest thing because we can do what we can do. And if you aren't available, if you aren't communicating with us, if we don't know where in the world you are, we don't know what you look like, we don't know what's going on, then how are we supposed to correctly sell you? And um, that's the big thing is I always tell our assistants and you guys will laugh at me but they tend to go above and beyond, which is great. I want my assistants to go above and beyond, but they're doing things and setting precedents that I don't always love because of the fact that it's true. I cannot pull somebody to the Oscars. I can't pull somebody to be a spokesperson. You can't pull somebody and make them want something. And, you know, we'll do it now. We'll do it till the end of time. I will find someone else. Excellent. It's, it's, a, t it's a terribly sad note to, to, to end on for me. And I understand <laughs> that. But at the same time, you know, this is a business you, ch I didn't choose this business. You chose this business knowing it full well, the difficulty that comes with it. So you need to accept it and acknowledge it. And like Mike said, if you don't, if you're, it's not fun for you, or if you're in a rut and then, you know, there's a thousand other things that you can do. They'll give you a whole lot more happiness and success. This is not a fun business for anyone. It's second to music, I think, the music industry. 
That's at least my opinion on this in this town. My nugget, and I'm going to try to squeeze one useful thing in here so Victoria feels like she learned something today. <laughs> um, I want to remind you that commercials are difficult to book because those of you who work in the theater and those of you who work in episodic television, those of you who work in film, you are a part of the entertainment industry. Those of you who work in commercials, you are part of the advertising industry. So if you really want to get better at booking commercials, get better at understanding how commercials work and why they are created, because this is not about your talent. And as much as people will tell you it is, it is not about your look. It is about what a brand is trying to say about their product that will stick in people's heads. So those moments that you create in commercial auditions are, are shaped differently than your self tapes for film and your self tapes for uh television and your self tapes for theater. You got to think about what it is they're selling and how they are presenting that message. The last thing I'm going to say is that I'm a big fan of changing the name of actor to storyteller, because I think when you call yourself a storyteller, it reminds you of what you come to the room to do, that you are taking our story, whatever it is, whether it's a commercial message or a film or a TV thing, and you are bringing to life that message through the work that you do. If you think of yourself as a storyteller, every time you come to the room, you won't be worrying about whether we like you and whether you got the job and whether you pleased us and whether you were obedient, et cetera. You will be thinking about whether you brought the story to life in your submissions, in your auditions, in your performances, in your life. Be a storyteller and you'll always be true to your art. That is an amazing, amazing way to end today's wonderful panel. I just want to thank all of our panelists today, Mike Abrams, Juliana Castro, Stuart K. Robertson, and Alicia Ruskin. On behalf of the SAG After Foundation, I want to thank you for sharing your experiences, your process, and craft with your fellow performers. Until next time, take care. <laughs>